Some of you may have forgotten some of the more basic concepts from a Mechanics of Materials course, and some of you may have never truly mastered them, despite doing well, at least grade-wise, in the class. This video is the first of a small series of videos where we'll recap some of the topics that need to be of second nature to any engineering student taking a mechanical engineering design course. Just in the same way some of the physics concepts are essential for a statics course, like for example force components, free body diagrams, sum of forces and moments, or how mastering shear and bending moment diagrams was essential for easily understanding their utility during a mechanics of materials course, these videos will highlight the most basic concepts from previous classes that you need to fully master before covering newer Mech 1 topics. More importantly, these videos will help you identify where your gaps are so that you can work on those either by yourself or by checking the additional videos I've recorded and linked in the description below. Today we will talk about axial loading, the definition of stress and strain, elastic modulus and yield strength, and we will solve a very simple structure problem, where we use these topics and more importantly, situate their importance within a Mech 1 course. The reason we don't just stop at calculating forces, like we used to do on Physics 1 or Statics, is because we could have two very similar structures, let's say a simply supported beam that is subjected to a point load of 5 kN and not break, and then have another beam subjected to a point load of 1 kN and have it break. There might be more than one reason for this. The beam on the left might be thicker, or it may be made out of a material that can withstand a higher stress. So looking at a 5 kN force versus a 1 kN force is not enough. And that is why we use stress, which is defined as force per unit area. From previous courses, you know that there's a difference between engineering stress and true stress. With engineering stress being the load over the initial area, and true stress being the load over the instantaneous area at any given point. Of course, as you stretch something, the cross-section area becomes smaller. So even for a simple tensile test, true stress and engineering stress will be different. Strain is defined as the change of length per unit length. And again, there's a difference between engineering strain and true strain, where engineering strain is the change of length over the original length, and where true strain is the integral of dl over l integrated from the initial length. In most engineering applications, we end up using the engineering stress and the engineering strain. And since we don't need to make a distinction between initial area or instantaneous area, we just call this axial strain load over area and the engineering strain deflection or displacement over length. The relationship between these two concepts is of very high importance for many engineering applications, especially within the elastic range. From previous classes, you probably remember the stress-strain curves, where we have stress in the y-axis and strain in the x-axis. The stress-strain curves will be different for, for example, polymers, metals, and ceramics. But within the elastic region, you would always somehow be able to calculate the slope of that straight line, which would be rise over run, or the ratio between stress and strain, that we call the elastic modulus. A brief parenthesis here, if we were looking at the true stress and true strain for metals, for example, we would see that both the ultimate stress and its corresponding strain would be higher. And I mention this now because a property called the true fracture strength will be important for some of the applications that we'll discuss later in the course. Also, worth pointing out now is that the scale for the axes I use is not the same for all three plots. A metal stress strain curve would have a much gentler slope on a ceramics plot and a low density polyethylene curve would probably only be visible in the ceramics plot. Now going back to the elastic modulus and using the expressions that I have for stress and strain, I would find that the elastic modulus is equal to PL over A delta, or if I'm solving for that delta, that the displacement or deflection is equal to PL over AE. Let's take a look at a simple example of a structure that is subjected to a 200 kN load. I know the distances between points A, B, and C, and I know that members A, B, and B, C are both made of a material with an elastic modulus of 200 GPa, a yield strength of 350 MPa, and a cross-section area of 1800 mm2. I would like to know the stress and the displacement in member B, C. I know that to answer these questions, I need to find the internal force from member B, C. To find that force, I use basic statics or physics, and I know that there's multiple options to finding this force. I could do a free body diagram of the whole structure to find reaction forces A and C, and then a free body diagram of BC and AB separately to find the interaction forces. But I know that it's all too complicated. I know that in this case, I would just do a sum of forces for joint B. 
Notice that the sub indices that I'm using start with the letter B because their force is going from B to A and from B to C. And notice that the direction of the vectors are set so that members BA and member BC are assumed to be under tension. We do this on purpose so that when we solve for the variable FBA and the variable FBC, positive values will indeed mean that the members are under tension and negative values would mean the opposite, meaning compression, which is anyways the convention that we always follow. If any of this is not second nature to you, make sure to check out the links in the description below, where we go over some examples of basic statics analysis. From sum of forces in the x direction, I find out that FBA is equal to minus FBC. If finding the components of a vector in the x and the y direction is not completely clear to you, you can check out some of the other links in the description below. Using this information and doing a sum of forces in the y direction and knowing that the angle theta is equal to 45 degrees, I find that FBA is equal to 100 square root of 2 kilonewtons and FBC is equal to minus 100 square root of 2 kilonewtons which like I explained earlier means that member BA is under tension because its internal force is positive and member BC is under compression because its internal load is negative. And remember, this is only true because of the direction I chose for the vectors FBA and FBC. If you choose any other combination of directions of the vectors FBA and FBC, you would still get the same answer and get to the same conclusion about tension and compression, but you would just be adding extra steps. Going back to the stress, I find that the stress is equal to minus 100 square root of 2 kilonewtons over 1800 millimeters squared, which yields 0.0783 repeating gigapascals or 78.3 megapascals. And substituting the values for the displacement BC, I would get minus 100 square root of 2 times 2 square root of 2 for the length of member BC, which is the hypotenuse of a right triangle of sides 2 and 2 in meters over 1800 millimeters squared times the elastic modulus of 200 gigapascals. Since the displacement is only 1.1 repeating millimeters and the dimensions of the members are 2 square root of 2 meters, I can assume that even though member BC is compressing and BA is stretching, the dimensions of the triangles remain mostly the same and both angles theta are almost exactly 45 degrees. As for the stress, in your mechanics of materials course you usually had an allowable stress that you would compare to the calculated stress from the structure you were analyzing. One of the first few things that we'll look at in this course is how to compare those calculated stresses, mainly the principal stresses, to the material properties of your material to calculate a more accurate factor of safety. If you take a look at what we did, you'll notice that a good portion requires you to have a good understanding of physics, statics, and mechanics of materials, and that only a small portion of mechanics of materials will actually overlap with the concepts from a MEC 1 course. So make sure that you truly master the concepts from statics, physics, and mechanics of materials so that you're not held back by them when trying to absorb new concepts or trying to solve the portions of the problems that should be very trivial by now. In our next video, we will take a look at torsion, specifically the torsional stresses and the angle of twist, including some common questions about that polar second moment of area. If you have questions about how this problem was solved, don't forget to check out the questions and the links in the description below. Thanks for watching.